Now, as we've said many times, there, there's a number of different approaches you can take when looking at the book of Revelation. We are taking a, which, which we think is the best fit, we are taking a literal approach, uh, which is probably the best way to approach the word of God, that God says what he means and he means what he says. Now, even though we're taking a literal approach to Revelation, that doesn't mean there isn't room for symbolism. In fact, there's a lot of symbolism in the book of Revelation, but Jesus, through the apostle John, usually makes it clear when he's using symbolism, which is exactly what we're going to see in Revelation 12. Revelation 12 12 starts with the the statement that I saw a great sign. That's what the apostle John says. So we know that it begins with a vision that John has, and this vision is a Uh, symbolism. It's symbolic of something uh, greater. It is a a great chapter, as we'll see, because there's a great sign, there's a great dragon, there's the great wrath of God, and there's going to be a great eagle. We're also going to see a mysterious woman who gives birth to a son, and that son rules all the nations with an iron fist. Now, when we get into symbolism in Scripture, sometimes it's easy to get lost, and it's easy to get um, a little disoriented, and that would be really unfortunate if that were just the case for this chapter, because this great chapter gives us really a unique insight to our mortal enemy, the devil. Now, we don't do a lot of talking about the devil. I mean, Scripture isn't silent about him, um, but this is the story of, of our great God. But the devil is alive, and he's active in the world. And as we get into Revelation 12, we are going to see the motivations and the motives of the devil. Now, Jesus makes the devil's motivation clear in John 10.10 when he says that the enemy seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. That is the enemy's number one goal and aim in our lives is to steal and to kill and to destroy. So it's important to understand his motives and his tactics. And I think it's especially important for us as believers to understand why, uh, why he exists and why he desires to do what he wants to do. Because a lot of times we can take his work lightly. We can take his, uh, his intent in our lives lightly. And that would be a, a very big mistake. We obviously know that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world, but to completely ignore the devil's work and his desire to tear down and destroy would be a large mistake. He is a destroyer of lives. He is a destroyer of relationships. He is a destroyer of marriages. He is the author of anxiety and worry. He is the thief of joy and contentment, and he is the enemy of the gospel of Jesus Christ and anything that would testify of the goodness of our God. And he deserves no audience with the believer, yet we often lend him our ear. And we full well know who he is and what he's doing, and often we find ourselves listening to his lies and entertaining them. But here's the great news about this great chapter. It is about the victory over our mortal enemy, the devil. And that's what we're going to focus in on this morning. Let's pray and then we'll begin. Again, Lord, Words fail us when we try to express our gratitude to you for all that you are and the sacrifice that you made through your precious son, Jesus Christ, so that we may be right with you. This morning, I just ask for your Holy Spirit to move. I know my words are absolutely empty without the work of your Holy Spirit to speak into our lives. So I pray, Lord, that your word would have its place in our hearts, that it would do that work that you intend to do to change us, to refine us, to bring us through the trials and the suffering so that we come out on the other side looking more like you because we know this world desperately needs to see you. Not us, not our talents, not our abilities, but you, your goodness, your humility, your love, your graciousness, but also your judgment and your righteousness and your holiness. So again, God, we give this morning to you. We ask for your Holy Spirit to work. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's begin in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. 
And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains, in the agony of giving birth, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems, or crowns. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them down to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now the obvious question is, what does all this symbolism mean? Who is the dragon? Who is the woman? Who is her child? And I think if we start with the child and work backwards, we'll have a better idea of the different symbols in this chapter. We know that it's a male child, one who is going to rule all the nations with an iron rod, who was caught up to God and to his throne. Who is this? Jesus. You guys are Bible scholars. Both Psalms 2 and Revelation 19 refer to the Messiah as ruling and reigning with an iron rod. It's fairly plain that this is none other than Jesus Christ. So who is this woman who's giving birth to Jesus Christ? Now there's a lot of different views in a lot of different circles. It is taught in some Protestant circles that this woman is the church. But that wouldn't make a lot of sense. Because the church never gave birth to Jesus. Jesus gave birth to the church. So we're not going to go down that road. Now the Catholic church, many of you grew up in the Catholic church. Who, who is this in the Catholic church? It's Mary. If you've seen artwork of Mother Mary or the Virgin Mary, you know that she is often uh, painted with 12 stars around her head, sometimes carrying a baby. We have some artwork here. Maybe art that you've seen before. It's Mary carrying the child and the 12 stars around her, her head. So again, the Catholic Church teaches that this is the Virgin Mary. And then the bride. Who's the bride throughout Scripture? The church. So it's not uncommon for Scripture to use a woman as symbolism for a religious system. So again, who is this woman clothed with the sun, with the moon at her feet, and a crown of 12 stars? Who else could have given birth to the Messiah if this isn't the Virgin Mary? Well, there's a, there's a principle in systematic theology, or, or put it more bluntly, there's a, there's a principle in Bible study called the principle of first mention. If you ever come to something in scripture that you don't quite understand, whether it be symbolism or something else that's difficult, there's a principle called the law of first mention or the principle of first mention. Go back to the place where that thing was mentioned first. And that should begin to clarify what you're looking at. And where are these 12 stars mentioned first? Anybody have any ideas? In Genesis. That's a great place to go. Go to the book of Genesis, chapter 37. Genesis 37. In chapter 37 of Genesis, we find a young man named Joseph, a young dreamer, who has these dreams that he should probably keep to himself as we'll see here in chapter 37. He's prone to sharing these dreams with his brothers and his father and his mother. And one of these dreams he shares is in verse 9 of 37. We read that Joseph dreamed still another dream, and he told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars they bow down to me. And in verse 10, Jacob unknowingly explains the prophecy to us because he says to his young son, Joseph, 
Shall I and your mother and your brothers bow down to you? uh, Jacob understood the significance of this dream. He said to his son, do you you really think that I'm going to bow down to you and your mother's going to bow down to you and your 11 older brothers are going to bow down to you? See, in this dream, dream, Jacob represents the sun, Rachel, the moon, and the 11 brothers, the stars. Well, that only makes 11 stars. Who's the 12th star? Joseph. And those 12 sons become what? The nation of Israel and the 12 tribes of Israel. So who is this woman who gives birth to the Messiah? It is the nation of Israel who is often represented in the Old Testament as a woman. And this pain of birth, as we'll see as we study this chapter in Revelation, this pain of birth represents the constant persecution of the nation of Israel. This constant supernatural persecution of the nation of Israel that they have faced throughout history from their inception. We need to ask ourselves, and many of us as believers know why. Why has the nation of Israel been persecuted more than any other nation in history? Yet they still are alive. They are still present well, because God is sovereign. Look at verse 3. So again, this woman is the nation of Israel giving birth to her son, Jesus Christ. Because we know that Jesus was brought out of the line of Judah. King David's line. Verse 3, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great dragon, who we know to be Satan, the devil, with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads... Seven crowns, seven diadems. And his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Now Satan is described here as a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his seven heads. And again, we are looking at a sign here. Satan is represented as a great red dragon because that is the nature of Satan. He is violent and he's murderous. And he seeks to destroy and devour. And the crowns represent Satan's desire for control, to manipulate and to be that great puppeteer that we know him to be. That is the nature of Satan. He desires to be king. He desires to be worshipped as God. That is the very reason he was kicked out of seven and a third of the angels were kicked out with him as that great tail of the serpent cast a third of the stars down to heaven. See, pride and attention seeking, we've said this so many times in the past, Pride and attention seeking looks so out of place on a follower of Jesus Christ because it is the wardrobe of the devil. The Christian is to put on humility. The Christian is to put on submission. Yet we often find ourselves just constantly wondering about what others think of us. We find ourselves battling that pride and that attention seeking and and looking to please man rather, rather than please God. Understand that's not simply a bad idea. That is the work of Satan. He is the father of pride and arrogance. He is the one that saw that the worship that God was receiving and said, No, that that should be directed to me. That should be mine. And he he wanted to touch God's glory. And it's a scary thing in the church today when we are comfortable touching God's glory, taking credit for our talents and our our abilities, loving the praise of man, being addicted to the praise of man, wanting to do what we do so that we get the pats on the back and the appreciation of those around us instead of understanding that we are serving God and Him alone. And the church benefits from that absolutely, but he is the one that we seek to please, not the world around us. 
Pride is a wicked, wicked master. And it is the wardrobe of Satan, not the wardrobe of the believer. We are to wear humility. So why seven heads and ten ten horns? Well, John Corson points out that the seven heads with the seven crowns represent the city where the Antichrist will reign in the end times. This city is often referred to throughout history as the city of seven hills. Where is that? Rome, the city of seven hills. And the ten horns, horns throughout Scripture, are represented as national powers, nations. So these ten horns, just like the ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's statue in Daniel's dream, they represent a ten-nation confederation that will emerge out of the old Roman Empire. And we'll get into that at in in great length as we move through the book of Revelation, but not this morning. So then again, we read that this great dragon, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them down to earth. That is the initial fall of Satan and the demons. Again, stars in scripture often refer to angels. And what did the dragon do after he was first cast out of heaven? What did Satan do? What was his primary motivation after he was kicked out of heaven? He sat by this woman waiting for her to give birth so that she may devour, so that he may devour devour the child. And that's been the history of Israel. That's been the history of the Jewish nation since they began. Endless and unrelenting persecution. It's easy to look at the persecution of the nation of Israel and think that it has something to do with mankind. It has something to do with Pharaoh and Hitler and Haman and Herod. That something just got into these guys' minds and they wanted to persecute the nation of Israel. They wanted to wipe them off the face of the map. And don't get me wrong, they cannot blame the devil. The devil made me do it. The devil used their pride and their arrogance and their hatred and manipulated them to try to wipe Israel off the face of the map. In Exodus 1.22, we read, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. If you'll recall, Pharaoh looked out over the nation of Israel and saw that they were growing by leaps and bounds, and he started to get scared of their size. So he had a great plan. Kill every firstborn son. But again, God is sovereign. And little baby Moses was put in a basket and sent down the river to be found by the princess. In Esther chapter 3, verse 5, we read that when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down to him, Mordecai being a Jew, or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury, again, using this man's pride and using him as a pawn. So Haman disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of that wonderful place. (laughs) Matthew 2.13. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. We know this to be Mary and Joseph, obviously. He appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take your child, your child Jesus, and his mother, and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to what? To destroy him. This is the enemy at work throughout all of history to try to put to naught the plans of God to bring about a Messiah. To wipe Israel off the face of the map because if Israel is gone, then the prophecies cannot be fulfilled and the Messiah cannot come from the line of David, from the tribe of Judah. 
Guys, this, this isn't just something that, that Christians believe, at least in the persecution of the nation of Israel. Go look at history. Secular historians have recorded the events that have surrounded this great nation of Israel. Why? Why has such a people been persecuted? Why did Herod, this great and mighty king, believe these old stories, these old prophecies that a Messiah was coming? Because the enemy was at work in his life. The enemy used his hatred and his pride and his arrogance as a, and he used him as a pawn. And let's not make a mistake here and think that he won't do the same with us. That's where we, you hear this, uh, these Christian phrases get thrown around. Don't give the enemy a foothold. Well, what does that mean? It means allowing our flesh to reign. Allowing our sinful desires to give birth. And produce death. We take the enemy so lightly. But let's understand this morning his motivation is to steal and kill and destroy. And he'll use our pride. He'll use our arrogance. He'll use our guilt. He'll use our shame. He'll use whatever we'll give him. To accomplish the work that he desires to do. See, these men weren't working under their own volition. I'm sure that they thought that they were. They thought they were in control, but Satan was manipulating them. And you can look all the way back to Cain and Abel to see Satan at work in a man's anger. Guys, Satan knows the word of God better than you or I. And remember, God spoke to him in the garden, and he cursed him and he told him in the garden that the seed of woman would crush his head and he didn't forget that so from that point on he has been hell bent on destroying her seed because if he can destroy Israel he thinks he can destroy the Messiah but we know his plans failed that Jesus Christ was born And although Satan worked in the hearts of man to murder Jesus Christ, Jesus rose again on the third day, defeating death and defeating sin and crushing the head of the serpent. So we might ask then, why are the Jewish people still persecuted? Why did the Holocaust take place? If Jesus already came and did that work that God promised that he would do, and he crushed crushed the head of the serpent, why do the Jewish people continue to be persecuted? Why do we see them surrounded by nations that want to wipe them off the map? Why did Hitler single them out, as well as other groups of people, but why did Hitler single them out specifically for destruction if the Messiah has already come? Because there are still promises to be fulfilled as we've been seeing in the book of Revelation. Satan thinks, hey, I didn't get him the first time. Well, he promised to come again. And he promised to rule and reign over his nation of Israel. So if there's no Israel to come back to, then that prophecy cannot be fulfilled and God will be made a liar. But we know that God is not a liar, that the devil is the father of lies. And when God speaks, it comes to pass. Guys, there's no question why there's a prevailing sense of anti-Semitism in the world. Look no further than chapter 12 of Revelation. Let's continue in Revelation chapter 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. How many years is that? Three and a half. Three and a half years, which is half of what? Seven. Again, where are we at in the timeline of Revelation? We are in the second half of the seven years of great tribulation. Now war arose in heaven, 
Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, and that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Now we might get a little lost here. Because didn't this already happen? Wasn't Satan already cast down with the angels? It's just, just repetitive. It's just, re, just repeating something that we already know. No. Well, some would ask, well, what's Satan doing in heaven? Satan has access to heaven right now. Satan has access to heaven. We see that in the book of Job, chapter 1. Satan appears before God. And God says, has, have, what have you been up to? And he said, I've been roaming the earth like I do, like a raging lion seeking whom I may devour. He didn't say that in Job, but we know that that's his motivation. And that's when God said, have you considered my son Job? Satan has access to the throne room, that is, until this moment. So first, why did the nation of Israel flee into the wilderness for three and a half years? We'll get to that. But now there's this war in heaven between Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels. Why make war now? Why make war now? Why wage war on heaven and the angels of heaven now. Why attack now? Now remember, we are dealing with Revelation, a study of the end times. I don't know if you've ever watched boxing, but if it goes 11 rounds, and it's obvious that one fighter is winning and if it goes to decision that that fighter is going to win when that bell rings for that 12th round the one who's losing comes out flailing because he knows the only way he's winning is with a knockout and so here's satan the last bell has rung the time is growing his time is growing short he knows it so he wages war in heaven. Who's in heaven right now? Who's already been raptured? Who's already been taken up? We are. The church. And here's Satan's last effort. But it's the same result when anyone or anything comes against the one true God. Defeat. He is cast down to earth. Look at verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now listen here, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of his testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you on earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows his time is short." There's a proclamation of victory to the church. Now, obviously, when we're caught up into heaven to spend eternity with Jesus Christ, we know there's no pain and suffering. We know we're protected and that no one will pluck us out of the hands of our Jesus. That's the promise that we've been given. But Satan launches one more attack, and obviously it fails because anyone who comes up against the Lord Almighty and his people will always be defeated. And so there's a a proclamation of victory. The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers 
has been thrown down. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. The tormenting of believers is officially over. This accuser, the one who keeps us up at night with accusations of inadequacy and guilt and shame, the one who runs those thoughts in our minds, suggesting things like, you know what? What are you trying to do here? Trying to be involved in the church? You're not a dad. You're not a father. You're not a mother. I can't believe you said that to your children. You're a failure. This isn't going to work. Stop praying for your family. They're never going to come to know Jesus. Look at the choices they're making. Who are you? Nobody cares about you. Your life is an accident. It was just a cosmic accident. A bunch of prehistoric ooze that just happened by accident to become whatever you think you are. We've heard it all. We've laid in bed thinking these things over and over and over again because Satan is the great accuser. He loves us. He loves when we wallow in our guilt and our shame. But we learn here that that time will come to an end. After his last effort to destroy the church. And how were we victorious? This is so important because it's how we're victorious today. It's how we're victorious at night when we're thinking about these things and we hear those lies from Satan. How are we victorious? By the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I know I'm nothing. I know I'm a sinner. I know all these things that you're saying about me that I've done. I have done them. The times you bring up my past, which I wish I could just forget. Yeah, that was me, even though it feels like a stranger. That was absolutely me. I did those things. But guess what? Jesus died for my sins. I'm covered by his blood. I have been forgiven. And that that forgiveness, it's not an excuse for me to go out and sin but it means freedom to love and serve those around me. So yeah, you, you yeah. say what you want, I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb. And I have my eternity sealed, not because of my own righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'm saved by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I am victorious by the word of my testimony. It's funny, people can argue theology all day long. You can go to someone who just simply does not believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that's fine. But what they can't take from me is what I've experienced in Jesus Christ. That he took a a self-absorbed drug addict that cared little about anyone but himself and made something good out of it. Oh, there's so much work to be done. But he took a dead man and brought him to life. No one can take that from me. You may be sitting here this morning thinking that this is a bunch of weird fairy tales. A woman giving birth to a child and a dragon. And and it sounds so fairy tale like. And that's, that's fine. But what you can't take from me is the hope that I have found. And you can't even argue with it. You can talk to my parents about how broken and ugly I was. And now I'm ugly and still a little broken, but but God is good. He's my father. I am his and he is mine. In Luke 9, 24, See, we're victorious by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the word of our testimony, and what's our part to play? Our willingness to lose our life, to find it in him. We cannot leave this out of the gospel because we tend to. 
because it's the hard part. Now, we are saved by faith alone and Christ alone, right? But that faith, true saving faith, says, you're God, I'm not. My life is yours. It's a trading, right? Beauty for ashes, joy for sorrow. My life of sin for your life of righteousness, sharing in the death of Christ so that we may share in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we learn in Luke 9.24, Jesus says, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and his fathers and the holy angels. This is the true gospel of saving faith. A dying to self. And an acceptance by faith of the personal work of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. So that's the victory that we have in heaven, the victory of the gospel. Rejoice those who are in heaven, the loud voice shouts, but woe to those who are still on the earth because the devil's mad. He knows his time is short. Verse 14, or 13. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. So who's Satan going after after he is finally for the second time cast out of heaven never to return? He's going after the nation of Israel. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to that place where she is nourished for a time and a times and a half time. So one is a times... Two is a times time, so we got one plus two, how much do we have? And a half times, how much do we have? Three and a half. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So the church is safe in heaven. Jesus promised that no one will pluck us out of his hand, and that promise has been kept. And so the devil is cast out, and what does he do? He goes after the nation of Israel. But the woman has fled into the wilderness where God has prepared a place for her and she is taken care of in the wilderness for that three and a half years of persecution. And wherever she is, it appears that the devil tries to flood her out. And there's a great deal of speculation as to where God will take his people during this time and many suggest that it's Petra. And if you don't know where Petra is, you actually do. If, you wa- well, if you've ever watched Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom, I don't recommend it, but that great temple built in the side of that cliff, that's not movie magic, that's a real place. Some believe that, others disagree. It's open to debate. What we do know is Satan will be enraged when he's kicked out of heaven, and he'll be even more angry when he can't get to the nation of Israel to wipe them out. So he'll go after any other Jewish believer who is still left on the face of earth. Now again, guys, Satan's primary motivation in all of this is clear. It's to destroy the people of God and to thwart the plans of God. From the Garden of Eden to the Battle of Armageddon, he wants to destroy anything that glorifies God and his primary tools for destruction, deceit and accusations, lies and guilt and shame. 
He is the father of lies. He is the great accuser. And have you been giving him an ear? Have you been giving him an audience? And if you have, it's time to come home to the truth. Not simply the truth, but the one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Set your mind on the things above, not the things of this world or earth. And the things of this earth are passing away. And that includes the devil and all his lies. The one who tries to define you. Tries to make you believe that your life is empty and worthless. Have you been deceived? It's time to come home. Again, one of those lies is that God wants nothing to do with you after what you've done. You've already come home and you've left and you've come home again and what would God want to do with you? Why would he want anything to do with you? And we know that is simply a lie. God loves you and he's waiting with open arms and he's saying, come home. There's more I want to do with you. I have a plan and a purpose for your life. You are not an accident. I created you, and you're special, and you're valuable to me. Maybe you're riddled with guilt and shame this morning. Come to the Father. He forgives you, and he welcomes you home.